Thank you all for coming to the final round of the German National Spelling Competition. First up, we have little Willi Schlinkerbacher. Willi, are you ready? Yeah. Willi, your word to spell is Rechtsschutzversicherungsgesellschaft. Could you use it in one sentence, please? Yeah. Your sentence is Rechtsschutzversicherungsgesellschaften is a ridiculously long word to spell. Rechtsschutzversicherungsgesellschaften. R E C H T S S C H U T C the German language, like the English language, is notoriously difficult for non-native speakers to learn, and German's unbroken words are amongst the longest in any language found on Earth. However, given the fact that more Americans have German ancestry than any other ethnicity, a family history researcher ought to understand a thing or two about the German language and its words. In this episode, we're going to explore some of the tricks of the trade that German-American genealogists use to add a little extra oomph to their research. We're going to talk about what you as an ancestry enthusiast need to know about German town names and how they can be deceptive, about German surnames and how they can be pronounced differently depending on what gender you are, about a completely unique alphabet that Germans used when writing documents 100 years ago and earlier, and also about a strange set of symbols that you will undoubtedly come across when you start researching in records from Germany. Then, we're going to be joined by an author named Ernest Thode, who compiled the German-English Genealogical Dictionary, one of the best resources for German-American genealogists. We're going to ask Ernest about how we can look for clues within the German language that can help us discover and better understand our German ancestors. All this and more ahead. I'm Josiah Schmidt, and you're listening to the German American Genealogist Podcast. <laughs> If you've ever tried tracing your German-American ancestors back to their hometown in Germany, you will have undoubtedly found that doing so successfully can be harder than besting a Bavarian in a sausage-eating contest. Why is this? Part of the reason is that the names of German towns were often very fluid. Town names might change over the centuries as the German language itself changed or they might get shortened to more easily pronounceable versions after years of colloquial tinkering. My paternal Schmidt ancestors hailed from a small woodland village in Hesse, called Machtlos. Speakers of the German language will, of course, recognize that the word Machtlos means powerless or surrender in English. However, this was not the original pronunciation of the town name. The town first appears in written records in the year 1329 AD, where it is referred to as Villa Mechtorfis, which translates to House of the Mighty Wolves. Now, at five syllables, Villa Mechtorfis is a bit of a mouthful. Imagine someone asking you where you're from, and it takes you longer to answer than it took for the questioner to ask the question. So, where are you from? I am from a place called City of Angels, Great City of Immortals, Magnificent City of the Nine Gems, Seat of the King, City of Royal Palaces, Home of Gods Incarnate, Erected by Viswakarman at Indra's Behest, uh, otherwise known as Bangkok. And where are you from? Yeah, I'm just from Detroit, otherwise known as the City of... Detroit. In the case of my ancestor's hometown name, Villa Mechtolfus, meaning House of the Mighty Wolves, got slurred together over the centuries until it became 
machtlos, which ironically means powerless. A lot of small villages in Germany weren't able to make the cut, so to speak, after the Industrial Revolution. And given that farming in the 20th century no longer needed to be as labor-intensive as it used to be, and given that the best jobs started to become available in large cities, a lot of tiny towns in Germany chose to become resorts or spa villages in order to keep from becoming ghost towns. Many of these towns added the word Bad, B-A-D, in front of their name, which means bath in English. In other words, designating that the town was a spa village, where people from the cities could go to vacation and get a little R&R. Thus, a town like Zvesten became Bad Zvesten. For many people who live in countries whose boundaries are largely defined by immovable oceans, such as Great Britain or America, it can be difficult for us to understand how the boundaries of what we now call Germany changed so often, and at many points throughout history were literally neither here nor there. Up until 1871, of course, there was no single nation called Germany. The area consisted of dozens of small kingdoms, principalities, duchies, and so on. Germany shares borders with about as many different countries as there are flavors of beer. These days you've got Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Switzerland, Austria, the Czech Republic, and Poland hanging out with Germany. And at other times throughout history, other countries have bordered Germany as well. The boundaries between Germany and each of these other countries have fluctuated over the decades and centuries, and many towns and cities near the borders have changed hands. Often, when a town would suddenly find itself within the borders of another country, the new ruling regime would change the town's name to another language entirely. It might be as subtle of a change as realizing that the once German city of Strasbourg is now the French city of Strasbourg. But if you had German ancestors who claimed to be from a city called Königsberg in der Neumark, you're going to have trouble finding that city on a map today. Yes, that's partly because that city is no longer in Germany. It's in Poland now. But furthermore, it's no longer called Königsberg in der Neumark. It's called Heine, and it's spelled C-H-O-J-N-A. Big difference. There are a couple of great resources that can help you track what became of a town that might have ended up on the other side of a national boundary with a different name. There is an article on Wikipedia called Cross-Border Town Naming that includes a nice long list of towns that have changed hands between Germany and neighboring countries over the years. One of my kind German genealogist friends also recommended an online gazette at genealogy.net called The Historic Gazetteer, which you can access by going to gov.genealogy.net slash search slash index. The Historic Gazetteer, or the GOV, as genealogists nickname it, describes itself as containing the names of churches, church districts, places, civil districts, regions, and more. Just simply go to the website, type in a place name, and hit the search button. And if your ancestors in Germany changing the spelling of their town names wasn't enough to trip you up, you will often find that your German-American immigrant ancestors came up with all kinds of creative spelling variations for their birth town name when they started using English as their primary language in America. I've harped on this point a lot in previous episodes, but it bears repeating. Germans in the pre-20th century era really did not care that much about spelling. It was all about pronunciation. If the combination of letters sounded correct phonetically when you pronounced it out loud, that was good enough for them. This is why, when I've researched people from my ancestral hometown of Machtlos, which is spelled M-A-C-H-T-L-O-S, I will find all kinds of different ways to spell it, 
whether it's using a K instead of the CH, or switching the A and the O around, or adding an extra S on the end. Maybe this is why our German ancestors would have probably preferred a sausage eating contest over a spelling bee. Another thing that threatened to trip me up when I was researching my ancestors' hometown was the fact that there were two German towns named Machtlos. This is to be expected. After all, there are many town names that you can find being used in just about every state in America. Gosh, how many Springfields do we have across the country? Don't! But what almost tripped me up was that there are two towns named Machtlos in the same province of Germany, the province of Hessen. Not only that, but these two towns, both named Machtlos, are in the same county in the same province. They are both in the hersfeld rotenburg kreis in Hessen. Given that these two villages are only 30 miles apart, and that they are both very similar in population size and even in appearance from what I've seen of photographs of the two towns, it could be very easy for people whose ancestors are from Machtlos bei Ranshausen to mistakenly think that their ancestors were from Machtlos by Breitenbach, or vice versa. If you think your ancestor is from a particular town in Germany with a certain name, do some research to make sure that you are aware of all of the other towns in Germany that have the same exact name, because chances are there are a handful of such towns. One particularly vexing example is the city of Rotenburg. You can find no less than three Rotenburgs within the province of Baden-Württemberg, two Rotenburgs within the province of Hessen, two Rotenburgs within the province of Sachsen, and two Rotenburgs within the province of Bayern. Always thoroughly check for any other towns in Germany that might have the same name as your ancestor's hometown especially if you're planning any vacations to Germany to walk in the footsteps of your ancestors. You wouldn't want to come back home with armfuls of souvenirs and photographs only to later find out that you were in the wrong place. Another important lesson that you will soon learn when you investigate old German records is that documents in Germany, especially prior to the 20th century, were often written in a very beautiful calligraphy but what looks like a completely different alphabet. You may find it impossible to decipher, even if you took a couple of classes in German language in high school. That's because old, handwritten German documents from the 1800s and earlier were written almost exclusively in a form of handwriting called Sitterling script. This is spelled S-U-umlaut-T-T-E-R-L. I N. Sitterling script was a form of flowing cursive that was much more jagged and angular than the cursive handwriting that English speakers are used to. There are many resources out there that can help you transcribe and translate German documents that are written in Sitterling script. If you intend to do any research in German records, you will need to be somewhat familiar with this style of handwriting because almost all of the documents, whether flowery church records or the more standardized civil registry records of later years, used Sitterling script. You may even find Sitterling script in use in German evangelical church records written by German-American immigrant pastors here in the States. I've provided one basic chart showing Roman alphabet characters juxtaposed with their Sitterling script counterparts on my blog at schmidtgen.com under genealogy tip number 17. A Google search can also reveal helpful pages to assist you in better understanding Sitterling script, and a book called the German-English Genealogical Dictionary also addresses this and has some handy charts. Speaking of church records, something I need to note about German church records is that there are generally two types. Katholische, or Catholic records, is one type, and another type you'll find will use the word evangelisch, which means evangelical. 
Evangelisch is a sort of umbrella term that describes most of the Protestant denominations in Germanic Europe after the Reformation. In Germany, this term was more likely to describe a church with Lutheran beliefs, and in Switzerland, the term Evangelisch was more likely to describe a church with Reformed or Calvinist beliefs. When Germans came to America, they often brought this word with them under the name of the German Evangelical Church or the German Evangelical Lutheran Church. In modern times, you'll be hard-pressed to find a German Evangelical Church left anywhere in North America, but the United Church of Christ inherited most of the legacy of the German Evangelisch religion. And here's another thing that caused me to raise an eyebrow when I was beginning my foray into researching records in Germany. It is that, sometimes, Germans would add the letters I-N to the surname of a female. This was done to designate that the person was, in fact, a female. Hey, baby, you looking fine in that red dress tonight. How's about you and me get out of here together? Ooh, any time, big man. Whoa! So, if you see a rather strange-looking surname on your German ancestor, like Schmitten, or Millerin, or Küchen, chances are that's probably not their actual surname. Their actual surname is probably Schmidt, Miller, or Küch, respectively. I suppose this could be helpful to differentiate the gender of a name in a document if it's a unisex name, like Christin or Foss. The practice of adding in to the end of females' surnames wasn't extremely common, but it was common enough that you do need to be aware of it in case you run across an instance of it. Finally, one other habit of German genealogists that we American researchers should be aware of is the German usage of symbols to designate genealogical events, like births, baptisms, stillbirths, marriages, deaths, divorces, burials, and so on. There is actually a long list of symbols that Germans use for just about every conceivable genealogical event that you might find in a record. But here are the most common ones that you will come across. The German genealogical symbol for a birth event is the asterisk, or star. If you're an American and you look down on your computer keyboard, you will see that symbol in the shift-up position over the number 8. A German genealogist will typically write an individual's birth event like so. Asterisk, 5, period, 10, period, 1786, Berlin. This means that the person was born on the 5th of October, 1786, in the city of Berlin. Their baptism will be represented by the tilde symbol, which is a short, horizontal, slightly wavy line. If you're American, you can look down on your keyboard and find this symbol in the shift-up position above the backslanted apostrophe, just to the left of the number one key. The German genealogical symbol for a marriage is the infinity symbol. This is a so-called figure eight symbol that's been flipped horizontally on its side. Americans won't find this symbol on their keyboard, but you can create it by holding down the alt key and at the same time pressing the numbers two, three, and six. It is also acceptable with German genealogists if you create the infinity symbol by simply placing two lowercase letter O's immediately next to each other. As it's not too difficult to figure out, the German genealogical symbol for divorce is two lowercase O's with a backslash separating them. In other words, the infinity symbol cut in half. The German symbol for death is the plus sign, which resembles a common grave marker shape. Just like all of the other genealogical events, if you wanted to express that an ancestor died on the 2nd of March, 1842 in Hamburg, you would type the plus sign, followed by 2, period, 3, period, 1842, Hamburg. To designate an ancestor's place and date of burial, 
Many German genealogists prefer to make a rectangle shape by putting two of the square bracket symbols next to each other. The square bracket symbols on an American keyboard would be immediately to the right of the P key. These two bracket symbols, forming a sort of rectangle when they are placed together, resemble a burial plot in a cemetery. There are also symbols that you can use for stillbirths. Many German genealogists just put an asterisk with a plus sign right next to each other for that one. And symbols that you can use to specifically designate when a person was killed in war, was born out of wedlock, was ordained as a minister, and so on. You can find websites listing all of these symbols by just googling the words German genealogical symbols. Next, after the break, we're going to be joined by author and genealogist Ernest Thode, who, quite literally, wrote the book on doing German genealogy as a native English speaker. He's the author of the German-English Genealogical Dictionary, and he's going to share with us some of his most effective tips to navigating German language and customs when researching your German heritage. You won't want to miss the words that Ernest has to offer, so stay tuned. If you would like to advertise on the German American Genealogist podcast, please click the Advertise With Us link in the podcast section on schmidtgen.com. Since we're such a young podcast, we have some really affordable prices if you would like an ad for your product or service to be featured in one of our episodes. Your advertisement will continue to pay dividends because these podcasts are archived and everyone who goes back to listen to an older episode will continue to hear your advertisement. Contact us today to get started. Today I'm speaking with Ernest Thode, who is the author of such great books as A Genealogist's Guide to Discovering Your Germanic Ancestors, Address Book for German Genealogy, and one of my favorites, The German-English Genealogical Dictionary. Ernest earned a Bachelor of Arts in German and English from Purdue and a Master's Degree in German from Stanford. He is an expert on German and German-American genealogy with particular expertise in the subject of translation. Ernest, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Glad to be here. What got you interested in genealogy? Well, I think it's because uh, my grandmother lived with us when I was growing up. She was widowed, and my mother was the one of the siblings who was most suited to take care of her in her old age. So I got to know her very well, my maternal grandmother. And she grew up in Germany. She had a hard time as a young girl. She had to tend the sheep from a young age and left Germany by herself when she was still a teenager, then got married in Indianapolis. But she told me a lot about Germany, and she had these documents, these baptismal certificates, and, and things like that that were just fascinating to me. I think that probably was the number one factor. And is your grandmother the reason that you were drawn primarily to German and German-American genealogy? Not just my grandmother, but my whole family, uh, my father's side as well. My father was born in Germany, and he and his brother came over in 1926. So I have it on both sides. Did you uh, grow up speaking German in your household, or did you learn that later in life? That's interesting. I did not grow up knowing German very much. I did not speak German in the household, but it's funny. When my parents didn't want me to know what was going on, they would speak in German, and it was a dialect, of the, <laughs> the Plattdeutsch. And I learned what was what they were actually talking about just by yeah. listening and, you know, picking up enough, you know, enough words. So I, maybe I knew more than they thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, what caused you to compile the German-English genealogical dictionary, and how long did it take you to write it? Uh, it was basically started on my computer as my own reference book. Uh, it took about 10 or 12 years to put together, and then it became uh, a published work, and it was basically for my own use. I needed to have one place where I could have all these reference books together, the, the book about weights and measures, the book about surnames, the book about male and female names, the book about abbreviations, book about symbols. It just was too hard to go through all of these looking for things. At that time, I was translating a lot of German records, so I needed it. <laughs> Primarily for my own use at the beginning, but then uh, I, I realized every, everybody really needed this, doing German-American genealogy. Absolutely. When I began to research in German records, I noticed that these records seemed to be written in some kind of alien language. And, uh, of course, I would later find out that this is a special kind of German handwriting called Sutherland script. Can you explain to our listeners what Sutherland script is where it came from, and why family history researchers with ancestry in German need to be familiar with the script? That's what everything was written in. And also the corresponding typeface for newspapers and so on, books, newspapers, was called Fraktur, not to be confused with the decorative documents of birth, marriage, and death that pastors in Pennsylvania, German country did, and pastors and schoolmasters. But the Fraktur typeface is the old typeface that was used almost exclusively in Germany up until about the 1940s. And same thing with the handwriting. The old German handwriting, and it's sometimes called uh, Gotisch or Gothic or Courant, which means their form of cursive, a running style of handwriting. But then in about 1920 or so, a style that was developed by a graphic designer, Ludwig Sitterlin, he developed this Sitterlin script, which was taught in German schools until 1941. But then there was a big change because at that time Hitler's German empire was covering more countries than he wanted for Germans to communicate with lands that had the Latin style, the Latin alphabet. The Sitterlin or Koran handwriting was the only style of handwriting that was used to that time, and that was used in documents. So births, marriages, deaths, confirmations, letters, all of that was written in the German style, which is not Palmer handwriting or Spencerian hand. So it is definitely a foreign alphabet, like Greek or the uh, Cyrillic alphabet. And I have to mention to our listeners that Ernest's book, The German-English Genealogical Dictionary, does have a chart towards the beginning of the book that shows some Sutherland script and their corresponding Latin alphabet counterparts. Uh, so if you're looking to be able to translate some of that script, his book can help with that also. You mentioned in your comments German newspapers. Have you done much research into German newspapers as a genealogist? Yes, that is one of my uh, interests right now. I am working on a book uh, now with a publisher on online German newspapers from around the world. And it's been amazing to me to find how many different newspapers from around the world have been digitized and mostly free. Not as many from the United States as we would want, but I've found German newspapers online from Adelaide, Australia, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, Tianjin, China, Moscow, Russia, and it's almost staggering the number of newspapers that are online and in various amounts. Some of them are short bands for maybe a year or two. Uh, others go 30 or 40 years. The Wiener Zeitung, I think, is uh, something like 250 years online. The Austrian newspaper collection, Anno, A-N-N-O, has many, many online. Also, Bavarian State Library in Munich has done a lot of those, uh, a lot of their holding, not just for Bavaria, but also some of the surrounding territory. So it's been eye-opening for me to do the research to find all of these. 
When can we expect your book on uh, German newspapers to be released? I'm not sure of the release date, but it's going to be published by the Genealogical Publishing Company or genealogical.com, as they're known. Now, what are some of the most important German genealogical terms that a family history researcher should know? Well, the main ones, I would say, would be the ones that deal with vital records, birth, marriage, death. Geburt, geboren, birth and born, verheiratet, married, or getraut, another word for married. Death is tot, died, gestorben, or verstorben, confirmation, confirmiert. Another thing is occupations, but I think we are probably familiar with a, a number of the occupations from names, such as, you might know this one, Schmidt. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Smith is the German equivalent of Smith, and these occupational names are right at the top of the frequency list of German surnames. Miller, Meyer, and Schmidt are the three big ones. Now, was Thode as a surname pronounced or spelled differently uh, by your ancestors in Germany? That's a good question. My ancestors spelled it T-H-O-D-E, the same as I do, but at one point it also is in some records uh, T-O-D-E, without the H. We would call it maybe a silent H, but Tode is how it was pronounced in Germany. That's how my father's, uh, that, that's the way he would have said it in Germany, but then in America it became Thode. I also know some people with my surname uh, do say Thode as well, but I, I make it a one syllable to rhyme with road or mode. Now, some surnames are occupational, and some might just be given to somebody because of what type of person they were or because of where they lived. Had you found out any sort of origin story for your paternal surname? I use the uh, etymological dictionaries, and most of them seem to think that it's originally a, an old German word that comes from Deutisk, which means the same thing as Deutsch, the people, the, the, the folk. So in a way, it's saying a German. A lot of surnames are that way. Sox means somebody from Saxony, or Bayer means somebody from Bavaria, which is Bayern in German, or Frankfurter, that's somebody from Frankfurt, or mm. Henry Kissinger, Kissingen, which is now called Bad Kissingen, the, the city in Bavaria. There are a lot of place name surnames which come from either a small territory or a larger territory, a city. It can even have to do with a locality, a feature like a hill, a berg. I was just working this morning with somebody whose name was originally Berg, B-E-R-G, Berg. You cite an interesting example in your book of how the word Morgan has two meanings. Uh, can you explain to our listeners the multiple meanings that the word Morgan can have in different contexts? Of course, if you say Guten Morgen, that's good morning. Morgan is morning. And if I'll see you in the morning, that'll be Morgan tomorrow. But sometimes it's used with land measure. It means how much can you plow in a morning? Well, that depends on where you are in Germany. Is the ground hilly? Is it rocky? Is it good soil or heavy clay? So the size of the Morgan is going to be different in different areas of Germany. And you actually do see this in records on maps in different areas of Germany. How much can you plow in a morning? It'd be like hmm. our measurement of acres. How many acres or hectares in the uh, metric system? What are some other German words that have multiple meanings uh, which might trip up American researchers? I mentioned Berg. People get B-E-R-G and B-U-R-G mixed up all the time. Both of them in, are on the end of cities' names, B-E-R-G, B-U-R-G. There are places called Homberg, H-O-M-B-E-R-G, and Homburg, H-O-M-B-U-R-G, and then the big city of Hamburg, H-A-M-B-U-R-G. A berg is a mountain or a hill. A burg is a fortress, a castle. It may sit up on the top of a berg, so sometimes it's a little hard to tell which is meant if you're talking about a place name, but really those two kind of get mixed up. Uh, one thing that people do get kind of mixed up in their uh, origins is where 
their ancestors supposedly came from. One thing is Wittenberg, and I've seen this in a number of instances where somebody claims that their ancestors were from Wittenberg, W-I-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G, where Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church door. Well, their ancestors were probably Lutherans from Württemberg, W-U-Ublaut, R-T-T-E-M-B-E-R-G, southwestern Germany, a region instead of a city. And they're far apart, both have Lutheran connections, and because a family was Lutheran, maybe they thought that they were associated with Martin Luther's city, but they were really from a different section of Germany. Likewise, you might find somebody who thinks they're from Bern, Switzerland. Well, they're probably misfit said, and, and sometimes this is in a census too, B-E-R-N or B-E-I-R-N or B-I-R-N or B-I-R-N-E. I've, I've found a, a number of different ways of misspelling it in censuses. They're from Bayern, which is Bavaria. Those are two things that are frequently mixed up. Now, why are there so many different German words for certain occupations, I notice? Uh, for instance, German records might refer to a farmer as Ackermann, Anspanner, Bauer, Landwirt, Pechter, or they might refer to a mayor as Bürgermeister, Schultheis, Schulze. And I've seen all of these terms used in the records for the same town in the same time period. Are they purely synonyms, or is there some small difference in meaning between these words? There usually is some difference in meaning. In my book, I tended to put large farm owners in one category and cottagers in another one, and then people without any land in another. Of course, most of these were agricultural occupations. There are terms for cottagers from house, like hoistler. It can be from a cottage, which would be a kata or a kota. So there'd be a kotner or katner or kurter or kurtner and cutter, kotman, different terms for people in a cottage. Or somebody is like an auszügler. This is an old retired farmer who has moved out of the main part of the house. He's ausgezogen. He's He's moved out, so he's the Auszügler. And so he's now living in a chamber in a probably an unheated room in the house, but he he uh, has retained the right to have food, and uh, he can go down and, and warm himself up by going into the main heated part of the house. That is something that is frequently, what we would call it is life estate. The uh, son or son-in-law usually is the one who is then in the house. And uh, an Ackermann probably has something to do with plowing the acres. It's a cognate word with the English acre. Acker, acre. Bauer is probably a more general term that fits a lot of these. A Landwirt is probably somebody who is an agriculturalist. You think of maybe a landowner. And on the titles of Bürgermeister and so on, a Schultheis is originally somebody who heises the Schult. He uh, announces the tax. So he, he goes around and tells everybody how much taxes they owe. And Schulze is a regional thing. It's northern Germany. A Bürgermeister is more often in, an elected official, elected by the other citizens rather than appointed. A Schultheis is probably the appointed office, a Bürgermeister, an elected office. But they're all subject to a little bit of variation and in interpretation. Now, you mentioned that uh, Schulze was mainly a northern word. What are some of the biggest differences in word usage that you've noticed between various regions of Germanic Europe? One of the things is in occupational titles, in the south, maybe in Austria, a potter might be a Hofner. In the central part, they might be a Töpfer, T-O-Umlaut, P-F-E-R. And in the north, they might be a Pötter, P-O-Umlaut, T-T-E-R. Or th there are variations of these two. Uh, Pötker is 
P O Uma T T K E R I've seen and Hoffner may sometimes get an umlaut. Those are three different terms for the same occupation, and you can get different terms for the same occupation with butchers. A metzger is probably the biggest area in southwestern Germany, and then you have the Fleischhacker, somebody who hacks the meat in Austria, a Fleischer in Saxony and eastern areas, and a Schlachter who does the slaughtering in northwestern Germany. Those are a couple examples. What are some of the biggest ways you've seen the German language change over the last few centuries? You mentioned the spelling of my name, uh, the T and the TH, that's one thing that's changed sometimes. Ratzkeller, R-A-T-H-S, K-E-L-L-E-R is the cellar under the town hall where they kept the wine, usually. The R-A-T-H for the council, or the R-A-T, the modern spelling, drops the H in most cases. But both of those still persist sometimes, with the H being still there in, in Rotz Keller, usually. Some town names with K and C, Kassel, or K-A-S-S-E-L, or C-A-S-S-E-L, maybe in the mid-1800s, it was C-A-S-S-E-L, or for Cologne, C-O-U-M-L-N, instead of the modern spellings with the K, K-A-S-S-E-L, or K-O-U-M-L-N. What tips would you have for an American family history researcher who's trying to translate a German document, and they come across a word that they just can't find in any German-English dictionary? What would be their next step? You might try to break down the word into its parts. German has a lot of compound words that are made up of multiple sections. Try breaking it down into smaller parts. Another thing, don't get too hung up on a particular spelling of the word. Uh, we've just seen some examples of how spellings can vary. I taught German in high school, and I got a lot of creative spelling. Not everybody writes with perfect spelling, and in fact, a lot of German words did not have fixed spellings until quite late, like say the late 1800s, so allow for a little variation. That might have bugged some of those German school teachers in the 1800s. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> and I would add that another thing I've found is that if you're having trouble finding a German word in a German-English dictionary, it might be because that German word is a proper noun. It might be a place name or a person's name, and therefore it wouldn't be part of the general German vocabulary. So if you have a German word that you're having trouble translating, it's been helpful to me to look at a map of the area in Germany that you're dealing with and see if perhaps you can find a town name that resembles this word that you're having trouble with or to look for perhaps a German given name or surname that resembles this mystery word. What would be your number one piece of advice for people who were just beginning to research their German ancestry? Don't get too hung up on what you think is true. If you think that your ancestor was Johann Schmidt because it says Johann Friedrich Schmidt in some record, so, okay, he went by Johann. That is American usage. In German usage, that's not true. You may not know that. So, actually, he probably went by Friedrich. He probably had brothers named Johann Adam and Johann Bernhardt and Johann Conrad and Johann Dietrich, and they were all Johann. When mother called, she didn't call. Call me, Johann! <laughs> she might have had a whole household coming. <laughs> yeah, so that's one thing. Another is be aware that there are differences in translating names. Sometimes if you say Christ something or other, K-R-E-I-S, that's the word for county. And if you say Christ Kuzel, you may think that that is a place, but it's really the word for county. It's like if you were looking for County Cork, Ireland, you wouldn't look in the gazetteer for a place called county. You'd look for Cork. You need to understand whether you're dealing with a place or a word for a geographic division. Also, dates use the European or military style. That's another thing. Be aware of the differences between American and German research. And by European-style dates, of course, 
they usually go from smallest to largest increments of time. So it would be day, period, month, period, year. Is that right? Yes. Like 07.04.1776 is not the 4th of July, but the 7th of April in 1776. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that uh, a place name with Kreis, K-R-E-I-S in front of it, does not denote a town. Because in my own personal research, I have ancestors who are from a county called Kreis Rotenburg in Hessen. And a lot of other researchers I've noticed will have ancestors from that same county. And there is a city called Rotenburg in that area, and they will assume that their ancestor is from the city of Rotenburg rather than the county. Their actual town where their ancestor came from might be 40 miles away from the city of Rotenburg. Uh, So I think that's very important, and I'm so glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that, too, because I have ancestors that came from the Kreis of Rotenburg in Hanover. Mm. Rotenburg an der Wimmer, a different Rotenburg. And then there's the famous, to American tourists, Rotenburg Ob der Tauber in Bavaria, which is Mm -hmm. another one. A lot of places have the same name. You have to know which one and have to get it properly into its uh, geographic location. Where can listeners go to purchase your book, The German English Genealogical Dictionary? I purchased mine through Google, but where else can they go to find it? Genealogical.com. G-E-N-E-A-L-O-G-I-C-A-L dot C-O-M. That's also known as the Genealogical Publishing Company in Baltimore. And you mentioned that you were working on a new book on German newspapers. Do you have a working title for the book yet? German Newspapers Digitized Online. All the listeners will have to keep an eye out for that book. I also do a column for the Palatines to America in the Palatine Immigrant called Ask Ernie, in which I answer questions about their ancestors, where to look next, where to try to find where somebody came from, or what's the next step in the research process. Where can listeners go to uh, read The Palatine Immigrant? Well, they uh, need to join the Palatines to America or, or go to their nearest library that has Palatine Immigrant. Great. Thank you so much for speaking with me today, Ernest. I'm ha- glad to do it. Your loved ones aren't going to be around forever. Have you ever wanted to sit down and ask your dad about his experience in the war, or interview your grandma to get her life story, but haven't been sure how to conduct the interview and how to ask the right questions? That's why I wrote my new book, 2000 Questions for Grandparents, Unlocking Your Family's Hidden History. 2000 Questions for Grandparents contains a manual on how to conduct family history interviews, as well as 2,000 questions on such topics as childhood life, memories of previous generations, world events, outlook on life, marriage and family, career and hobbies, spirituality and politics, likes and dislikes, travels and migrations, military service, and more. Purchase 2,000 questions for grandparents today at a special early bird discount on lulu.com. You can find a link to the book in the publications section at my website www.schmidtgen.com. I really enjoy doing this podcast, but I also enjoy researching genealogy for other people. My professional genealogy research services are available for hire on an hourly commission basis. If you have a genealogical brick wall and you'd like to get some expert assistance, please contact me at my website, www.schmidtgen.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the German American Genealogist podcast, and I hope you came away from it with a better understanding of German language and words, and how they can be used and misused. 
The German language can be tricky, as the German athlete found out at the last Olympics. Oh, you haven't heard what happened? Well, one of the security guards at the Olympic Stadium noticed a German man carrying a long case into the arena. The guard asked the German, Are you a Pole, Walter? He responded, No, I'm not a Pole, I'm a German. But how did you know my name was Walter? Okay, okay, I can hear the moans and groans, and I promise you I won't tell you the one about the German sausage because that one is just the worst. Okay, I hope you'll join me next Monday night for a slightly less punny episode of the German American Genealogist Podcast. Auf Wiedersehen.